Good morning, everybody, and welcome to those who are attending these hearings for the first time. Um, it's, uh, it's good to have you. Advocate Bauer. Madam Chi, Madam Chi, we are calling um, Advocate Glennis Breitenbach as our witness this morning. She is assisted for record purposes by her legal representative, Mr. Gerard Wagenaar. Okay. That's in order. Please state your full names for the purpose of the record. Glennis Breitenbach. Will you take an oath or affirmation? It is fine. I said that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Raise up your right hand side and say, so help me God. So help me God. Good morning, Advocate Breitenbach. You... Deposed to an affidavit on the 7th of January 2019. Do you have a copy of that in front of you? Uh, I do. And uh, that came about pursuant to a request from me that you assist this inquiry. That is correct. And can you confirm that the contents of this affidavit as set out in paragraph 2 thereof is, is correct? Indeed. Now, the, the matter has a long history before we go into questions. I just want to place on the record that there are a number of documentation germane to the dealings which Advocate Breitenbach had. There are labor court applications. There's the transcripts of the disciplinary inquiry. There was a subsequent criminal proceedings. All of those papers form part of the evidence before the inquiry and have been included um, in the drop box which the parties have been given. So I'm not going to be taking you through those things in any great detail, but there are aspects that you may want to cross-reference to it and then we will go to those particular documentation. I will take you to certain of the annexures which relate to those matters and which are also, for the most part, annexures in those applications. And there's been a bundle prepared, um, which should be over there. And the documentation have been put in chronological order in that bundle for purposes of the evidence you're going to give today. Thank you. Um, before, before you start, may I point out uh, something that I noticed when I was reading through my affidavit this morning? Uh, on paragraph 7, under background, uh, I, I say that uh, both um, Ms. Jibo and Mr. Mkwebe were brought back to the NPA by uh, Menzi Similani. Um, I believe this to be true at the time that I deposed this affidavit. Um, I've su subsequently been informed that it's in fact by uh, Mr. Mshe. So that is an error. Now, your background is set out in paragraphs five onwards of your affidavit, and I'm just going to take you briefly through it. You have both a B-Uris and an LLB degree, and you started prosecuting in 1987, correct? Yes. You were admitted as an advocate in 1992. Yes. Correct? And you specialized in prosecuting of commercial crime from 1990. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And you held various capacities in that until you became part of what was the startup project of the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit in 1999. Correct? Correct. You then became a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions in yes. that unit in That's 2001. Correct? I must point out that these dates are collated from other sources. I don't have 
any specific recollection of, of, of when I became what, I, I really couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you what I earned, so I just don't remember trivia. Yeah. So if we look at paragraph two of your affidavit, you point out can that... I, can I interrupt and ask that two things, if you could speak slower and louder. The, the transcript people are going to be complaining. I'll do so, my lady. What you do need to do is bring the microphone a bit nearer. Okay. Is that better? Thank you. You do point out at the start of paragraph two that you don't always from memory recall all the exact dates and where exact dates are indicated. These have been confirmed by contemporaneous documents. Indeed. Correct? But you do recall you were there at the start of the Specialized Commercial Crime Unit. Most certainly. Right. And that you were employed as a Senior Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions and you then became the Regional Head of the Office of the SCCU in Pretoria. That's correct. correct? I'm not going to explain that because I think we've had enough evidence of how that operates. Uh -huh. You then say you were aware that after the suspension, both the advocates, Jiba and Mkwebe, were brought back into the NPA by the then NDPP, and you've clarified that to be Advocate Mshay. Yeah, so I'm told. I, I have no independent... I, I really thought it was the Similani, yeah. Oh. As far as you are aware, Advocate Mkwebe became a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions in the Office of the DPP Pretoria. Uh, according to my recollection, yes. Yes. And you had interactions with them during that period. What was your first interaction, if you look at paragraph 9 of your affidavit, with Advocate Jiba um, in the capacity as regional head of the SCCU? Um, uh, Ms. Jiba Maybe came, not the first, but the uh, one you explained. Yeah, Ms. Jiba came back to the NPA. I'm not, I don't recall if I had any interaction with her uh, once she was back. Uh, we were in different offices. But one day, and I, 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 I seem to recall it was on a Thursday, or she came to my office to tell me that she'd been appointed as a deputy director in the SCCU Pretoria. Um, I said to her that um, there was no vacancy for, for that post in our office. Uh, she told me that it had been the instruction of, of Simulani, and um, I explained to her that we were, it was a small building and, and it was always overcrowded, that we didn't have a deputy director office. You know, in the public service, it's quite sad, uh, depending on your rank, depends, determines the size of the office you get. It's quite funny. So, so I didn't have a deputy director office for her. Um, and all that was available was a senior state advocate's office that had been vacated. Uh, and she agreed to move in there, but um, understandably, uh, a, a couple of days later, she was unhappy with her accommodation. Um, I, I certainly understood that, but there was nothing I could do. Uh, so um, there was an office being refurbished and renovated downstairs on the ground level, and I told her that she could move into that office once it became available, which she then did. And what was the response of the staff component at the SCCU when she joined? And they were extremely unhappy. The, 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 the vast majority of them were extremely unhappy. Uh, most of them had been with the NPA for a, for a, a long time. Uh, there was a lot of controversy surrounding uh, Ms. Jiva at the time. Um, and so they, they, they were unhappy. I told them that, um, that we were a unit, that uh, she was a member of staff like everybody else. They should offer her the same uh, courtesy as everybody else. I, I did not believe that she would be a passenger, that, that she was certainly capable of doing her job uh, as a deputy director, and that they should give her the benefit of the doubt. And what, do you, what as far as you were aware, did that happiness stem from? Well, it stemmed from the, I suppose, the circumstances that led to her being suspended initially. There was, there was a lot of uh, controversy surrounding the Celebi matter. And then uh, there was some involvement uh, with, uh, with the Gheri Nial debacle. Um, Gheri Nial has been a prosecutor in the NPA for, for many years. A lot of my staff prosecuted with him in Johannesburg. Um, and they, they were somewhat resentful. So there, there was a lot of unhappiness. So she started and then what transpired? If we look at paragraph 12 of your Well, affidavit. she started and... Uh, 
she, the, she, she went to the, the smaller office. She then indicated that she was unhappy with the smaller office. I said she could either have my office or wait for the new one. She waited for the new one. Uh, she wasn't terribly productive um, in terms of, uh, you know, getting matters ready for court. Uh, but I took the view that she had been out of the loop for some time while she was suspended that perhaps she needed time to get back into sort of the groove of things. Uh, she was new to the SECU and perhaps needed to get used to the procedures. Uh, and so I didn't, um, you know, put a, a huge amount of pressure on her to, to operationally get things done. And her, as, a, as a deputy director, she had uh, people reporting to her and her administrative duty she performed. Um, so, th th she, and she also was not there for terribly long, so, uh, so there wasn't, uh, you know, not a lot turned on it. And what uh, was the presence of Advocate Mkhwebi in your office? Well, Ms. Mkhwebi was there, uh, in my view, very, very often. Uh, it seemed to me like every second day. Uh, he was at the DPP's office, that's uh, two or three street blocks away, it's an easy walk. Uh, he was constantly, um, I constantly saw him at, at uh, the office. He was with um, Advocate Jiba all the time. Uh, so much so that I asked uh, Sibungili Mizniati one day if um, Mr. Mkhwebi actually had anything to do with his office because he spent so much time at mine. Um, it irritated me uh, because I formed the view that, you know, while he was there, she wasn't getting any work done. It was then from your office in December. Uh, 20, let me just get my dates right, but it was from that office that she got appointed as the Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions, correct? That's correct. So she went from being a uh, newly appointed Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions to being a Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions. Is that correct? She went from being a deputy director of public prosecutions. I'm not sure it was newly appointed. I think she'd held that rank yes. prior Sorry. to her being suspended. Yeah, that's correct. I if I remember correctly, yeah, that's that's so correct. She went from being a deputy director of public prosecutions to a, a deputy national director. Now, um, I don't believe. I certainly wasn't aware of that ever have, uh, having happened before. Uh, and uh, suffice it to say that that everybody was uh, very surprised. I think including herself. Okay. Why uh, do you say she was surprised? Uh, well, uh, my lady, if I was promoted from a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions to a Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions, I would be very surprised. Did she express surprise to you? Uh, I don't believe that we discussed it, no. So you're simply relaying a opinion? Yes, well, I would be surprised. I presume anybody would be surprised. It, it doesn't happen in the public service, certainly not in the NPA. And so that appointment takes effect in December 2010, and a year later she is appointed on the 28th of December 2011 uh. as the Acting National Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes, uh, again, uh, with alacrity. It's a, it's a very big job. It's a huge responsibility. Um, there were other people uh, when she was a deputy director of public prosecutions. There were other people, in my view, who were more qualified to be appointed as a deputy national director. And certainly each one of the directors of public prosecution notionally were more qualified. Uh, they were a, held a higher rank. They had had experience of running divisions. Uh, Sibungile Mizniati, for instance, had been an acting uh, Deputy National Director many, many times, so it, w it was a surprise. Um, becoming the national, the acting National Director was an, an even bigger surprise. There were three Deputy National Directors who had, um, you know, if I, I don't know how long Silas Ramonita has been there, but I think he's been a Deputy National Director for something like 20 years. Um, he's got a wealth of experience. Um, why somebody like him should be overlooked, somebody like Willie Hoffman, somebody like Toko Majakweni, who had held that position for years. Why they should be overlooked for the newbie uh, was uh, disconcerting and surprising, yes. You then go on and you describe in paragraph 15 um, your view on 
Advocate Jeeva's experience. Can yes, you elaborate well, on that? In my view, um, she was neither especially experienced nor particularly well qualified for the post of, of, uh, of, of an acting national director. As I say, there were three other deputy national directors who were all more experienced and, in my view, as a result of their experience and their exposure, more qualified. Uh, to be the uh, national director, um, you need to have a lot of uh, ex administrative expertise. You need a lot of experience. You, it's a huge organization. You need to be able to delegate effectively. You need to be able to uh, pull a team together. You need to uh, in be inclusive rather than exclusive. Uh, there, there are a lot of... Um, qualities that a, a national director needs um, to run an organization like the National Prosecuting Authority. It's, it's really a, a huge machine. It can't be done on your own. Uh, you need a lot of, and you need, in my view, um, a lot of life experience as well. Um, it's, not, it's not only a legal qualification that is required. Um, uh, in my view, you don't have to be a particularly competent um, uh, a prosecutor. You don't have to be a hotshot prosecutor to lead the National Prosecuting Authority. You need to have all of those other qualities uh, and a lot of life experience. You have to be able to provide leadership in prosecutions, most certainly, uh, but you don't have to be a court animal to do it. Uh, but you do need to, um, but certainly you need a lot of experience and, and most of all you need a life experience. Uh, and in my view there's no uh, substitute for life experience. Uh, and I, I, I held the view then, and I, and I do now, that uh, any one of the three deputy national directors had more of all of those qualities than Ms. Jima. And when you talk about you don't need prosecutorial experience, surely you must have some understanding of what goes on in the courts. No, I didn't say you don't need prosecutorial experience. So you didn't have to be a hotshot court animal. Uh, you do need to understand prosecutions because you have to provide guidance. That's prosecutions in both the lower courts and the higher courts. Certainly. And, uh, and you need to, uh, I think, uh, I th for, for myself personally, the most important qualities of a national director of public prosecution that supersedes all those that I've mentioned are you need to have a very strong grasp on ethics. Uh, you're leading a massive organization staffed by uh, officers of the court. Uh, you have to lead by example and you need to have unquestionable integrity. But you also say Advocate Jiba was a good administrator. Um, I don't have a lot of experience of her as an administrator, except in my office, in the smaller sense of, of running you know, seven or eight uh, other prosecutors. In, but uh, I certainly had no issue with her as an administrator. Yeah. And in your view, did Advocate Jiba embody that which you regard as necessary for a national director of public prosecutions? No. Why do you say that? I think, uh, in, in my view, I thought at the time, uh, that, and I still do, that she lacked the requisite uh, experience. Um, I had misgivings about her uh, integrity. Uh, I certainly held the view that she lacked the life experience. And uh, she had never done anything within the NPA that, that was of such a phenomenal nature that, that justified this inordinate amount of elevation to posts above people that I viewed uh, as more competent or more experienced, or better qualified. You, in your next paragraph, say the mood amongst the staff. Sorry? Sorry. Um, much has been made of um, certain decisions that were taken. Um, would you say, um, well, maybe the uh, uh, best way to, to, to um, give an example of is looking at the evidence that was given by uh, other witnesses the certain decisions that were made either on the Luli case, um, if, you, if you look at that, would 
would you say that the decisions that were taken point to the fact that there was no, not much experience on the part of, 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 of Ms. Jiba on, in the position that she held, if you look at the instruction that cascaded from the top and eventually the decisions that were made? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, I would love to be able to say that I thought that was the reason, uh, but I don't. I think the reason was a nefarious reason. We're going to come to your evidence relating to the Mluli matter mm. um, in a bit. Pointed out in paragraph 16 that the mood amongst the staff was that the NPA had been hijacked. Um, can you elaborate on that? Well, the, the NPA at that stage was starting to fall apart. Uh, poor decision making was the, the order of the day. The, we were rudderless, the, it was the lack of leadership. Uh, there was, I'm not going to pretend that there's never been uh, political pressure in the NPA. Of course, there has, and I think that's common throughout the world. Uh, but never of the sort that we were experiencing at this time. Um, and so the people that were supposed to protect the prosecutors from this kind of pressure were not, were not doing it. Uh, they were weak, they were vacillating. Um, it was my view and, and the view of many of my colleagues that um, this was being facilitated by people within the NPA, and Ms. Jeeva was one of them. Um, so allowing political interference of a nature that just simply cannot be allowed in an independent body. Um, there was a drive to close down specialist units, uh, not only the SCSU, all the specialist units. Ms. Nkwebi was particularly uh, vitriolic and vocal about closing down the SCCU. And uh, it was a view that I didn't share, of course. And, and so uh, there was a lot of unhappiness uh, in the NPA, and, and the staff were were restless and uh, and unhappy. They were concerned. They were deeply concerned. So was I. What was Advocate Jeeva's expressed view at the time in respect to the specialist units? Uh, well, Advocate Jeeva did nothing to prevent the closing down of the SCCU at that point. Uh, it was something that was started by, uh, I think it was Similani, uh, in, in, as far as my recollection goes, um, the dismantling of the SEC started with Similani. We were moved out from, uh, initially the reporting structure, as I recall it, was there was a national head of the, of the various SCCUs, who was Chris Yodan. Uh, he initially sat in the Pretoria office. He was later um, forced to move to the, the VGM building by Similani. Um, the SCCUs were then, in, in, a, in the beginning of the dismantling process, were moved out from underneath Chris Yodan's reporting structure. So. I would, for instance, as the regional head in Pretoria, and so the other regional heads also reported to Jordan. Uh, Jordan reported to Dr. Ramaite, uh, and that was the reporting line to the, to the national director. Um, at some point, we were moved out from a reporting structure to Jordan, and we were uh, told that we would fall under the um, authority of the DPPs. So I effectively then reported to Sibungili Mizniati, who was the DPP in uh, North Gauteng. And for all uh, purposes then, um, they, they became responsible for us. They had our budget. Uh, we had to apply to them for, for any um, expenditure. Um, my performance assessment was done by Sibong Gile. Uh, so we reported to that office. Um, uh, the entire Pretoria SECU did that. The Joburg SECU reported to Andrew Chauke, and so on. All the SECUs reported to the various DPPs. It left Chris Rudan in charge of, a, of an office of, I think, at that stage, it might have been three people. So I think there was the late Naomi Humphreys was in that office, uh, Michelle Ramurthy was in that office, and Kebe Kanyani was in that office. So, and they had nothing to do because no one reported to them. Um, so Jordan used to go to work every day. He, he became more and more unhappy. Um, he eventually became ill, I think, because of it and took early retirement. Uh, we carried on reporting to, to Stephen Gili Mizniati. Um, the three ladies remained in the SECU head office. I, I have no idea what they did every day to keep themselves busy. Um, and, uh, and at the management meetings of the DPP in Pretoria, it was made very clear that the, um, the SECU was being shut down.
And then a view get... that was very vociferously uh, supported by Mr. Mkhwebi. And, and then we have a special director appointed being... And then out of the blue, uh, just as things get, uh, get going with Mgluli, uh, Mr. Mkhwebi, of all people, gets appointed as the head of the SEC. That person that said we had no right to exist uh, is appointed as the, uh, as the special director. It was uh, quite astonishing. And he was elevated from the position of a deputy director of public prosecutions um, to the special director post. Yes, but, but that is a normal elevation. It's one rank. So there was, there was, uh, the, 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 the difference in rank was not an issue. Uh, the fact that it was the SECU particularly um, was, was what was so very surprising. And, uh, and of course, also the fact that uh, Mr. Mukhebi had never ever demonstrated any particular expertise in the field of um, commercial matters. Just get it clear who appointed Mukhebi. I think it was Simulani. I'm not sure. It might have been Ms. Jiba. I'm not sure. I, don't, I really don't recall, my lady, the, the dates. Um, I honestly haven't uh, traversed this stuff in any real detail for some time. And so I, I don't, uh, it might have been Mr. Simulani, although I seem to think it was Ms. Ms. Jiba. I think there was some issue. Uh, Mr. Mkhwebi was moved to the VGM building at some point by Ms. Jiba and, uh, and then went back to the DPP's office. Uh, but I, that's, I have only hearsay evidence about, about the reasons for that. So I think it may have been Ms. Juma. And I may be assist that on the 25th of November 2011, by proclamation, the president conferred, imposed, and assigned the position of special director on Advocate Mkwebi. Um, the government gazette is in the Dropbox at uh, folder A. Uh, Give me a second. Number 18. Um, it, it is so, of my course, lady. Of course we know the president appoints. Yes, okay. so. I guess my question relates to who was at the helm uh, of the NPA. That, that's the how time. I understood your question, so, my lady. Yes, so I, I suppose oh. the dates will show. Oh. Thank you. Oh. What was your view about Advocate Mkhwebi's appointment as the head of the SECU? You deal with that in paragraph 19 of your affidavit. Um, well, as I say, I, in my view, he possessed none of the requisite skills to hold that position. Uh, in my experience, the national head of the SECU needs to be a, a very good manager. You have various regional heads appointing to, uh, reporting to you. They have... Uh, quite large offices, mostly under them. Some of the offices are quite small, but some of the, you know, Pretoria, Johannesburg, um, Cape Town, uh, certainly I think Port Elizabeth were quite big offices. Bloemfontein was a, a little smaller. Um, but you have many uh, people reporting to you. There's a lot of administrative work to be done. Uh, you need to um, engage in a lot of stakeholder management. The SECU started off as a, a public-private partnership in 1999. We still had interested stakeholders from that period that had to be, um, had to be sort of kept happy. Um, there were many, many stakeholders that had an interest in the work that the SECU did, like the, uh, the Financial Intelligence Centre, the Reserve Bank, uh, the Revenue Services, um, all of those um, places. There were regular meetings with all of those departments uh, because there were many overlapping interests and um, so you needed to, to be very good at, at stakeholder management. Um, it was also, you know, um, a very successful unit. Uh, we had a, a very good uh, conviction rate. We didn't have a huge backlog. And, um, and the unit performed very, very well. And uh, much as um, uh, Chris Yodan was really a, a bit of a nitpicker, uh, it was because that he, he was a nitpicker that the unit did so well. He, his attention to detail was, was, was very good. He kept us all on our toes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, 
excuse me, and um, and so in my view, you needed a manager, uh, something. Um, I didn't think that um, Mr. Mkhwebi held had those skills, uh, but I had other misgivings about uh, Mr. Mkhwebi as the head of the SECU as well. He had. Is this supposed to make this noise? He had. Um, he had made uh, many, many, many comments about the SSU being elitist, uh, that it should be closed down, that we should be generalists, that we should be uh, diluted into the office of the uh, And that was the whole reason why the SSU was started initially, was to take us out of the office of the DPP so that we could uh, properly deal with commercial matters on their own. The minute you start using specialists to do other work, it does specialist work and so we had hugely divergent views on, on the SECU. Um, um, I also had a lot of misgivings about his ability as, as, a, as a, uh, a special director. Um, Mr. Mkhwebis uh, was the, the, uh, the head of the, the DSO component in KwaZulu-Natal at some point. Um, it wasn't a great success. Uh, he was, his post was advertised while he still occupied it. Leonard McCarthy had at some point tried to persuade Chris Yordan to accommodate Mr. Mkhwebi in the SECU office in Pretoria. Yordan refused. Um, Mr. Mkhwebi's reputation was not, uh, not one, that was, uh, one that was covered in glory. Were you aware of him having personal and successfully prospered any high-level commercial matters? I, I was not. Is that a requirement for somebody who's going to head up the unit? Can you just give us an opportunity? I'm sorry to do sure. this. Are we having problems with... Uh, what is going on? Can you just correct whatever is going on? Because it is disturbing the capturing of uh, the communications. Are we okay now? Oh, all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, my lady. Um, Uh, some of the prosecutions were, were very, very complex, very, very big. Um, commercial work by its nature is, you know, a lot of documentation. It takes a long time to finalise those prosecutions. You need to be a, a very good manager. You need to have a lot of attention to detail, and and you need to understand the intricacies of uh, prosecuting commercial uh, prosecutions. Um, I was not, because at the end of the day, you are the buck stops with you in giving guidance. Uh, you know, if a prosecutor comes to me and asks me for help with a case, uh, I hope that I would be able to give it. But if I couldn't, I would go to Chris Hedon and ask him, and he would be able to give it. He had prosecuted a commercial crime for most of his adult life. Uh, there was very little about prosecuting commercial crime that he didn't know. Um, and he was a very successful um, commercial crime prosecutor, and on the back of that he was... Um, he was granted uh, senior consultant status on the basis of his uh, expertise in commercial work. So um, I did not believe that uh, Mr. Mkhwebi was uh, remotely a replacement uh, for Chris Yudon. You also then go on to say that the person should have a sound command of law and jurisprudence. Why, well, yes. did, why uh, did you think Advocate Mkhwebi didn't have that? Well, I'd, I'd um, had quite a lot to do with uh, Mr. Mkhwebi. Um, prior to that, and I uh, had consulted with him on, on other matters. Uh, he never demonstrated a particular grasp of, of those issues. And, and his behavior while he was in that post also didn't uh, inspire me with any confidence. Uh, certainly the way he dealt with the Mluli matter, uh, I, I do hold the view, was um, decidedly uh, wanting both in, in grasping uh, the, the facts, the merits, the law, and the way to deal with it. Now you say in paragraph 21 of your affidavit, and then we're going to touch on that, that he started corresponding and giving you instructions even prior to him being lawfully entitled to do so. Why do you say that? Well, in my view, uh, I reported to Sibungidi Mazniati at the DPP's office. That was 
the arrangement with, within the National Prosecuting Authority, nothing had changed. Um, with the appointment of uh, Mr. Mkwebi, it was clear that uh, in all probability we would be moved back to the SECU at some point, but the NPA's financial year starts on the 1st of April, uh, and uh, it was uh, made very clear that we would continue resorting under the DPP until the end of March. Um, when Mr. Mkwebi started corresponding with me, uh, he had not yet been appointed. Uh, it was prior to the promulgation. Uh, I certainly didn't know that he had been appointed. Uh, I didn't acknowledge that he had been appointed with no um, promulgation. But besides that, uh, I reported to Sibon Gideon Bizniati, and I regarded it as, uh, to put it at best, mischievous for, uh, for him to uh, correspond with me directly and give me direct instructions when I reported to uh, Ms. Nyati, who was his rank equal. Um, it would be similar to a DPP from a different provincial division uh, giving me instructions without consulting Ms. Nyati. It's, it's not done. It's, you just don't do that. I had uh, requested that you consider the transcript of the evidence that Jan Ferrara gave last week. Did you have an opportunity to do so? Um, I read the evidence in chief. Um, I read a portion of the cross-examination. I unfortunately didn't get time to read it all, but I did read his evidence in chief, yes. And can you confirm whether you agree with that which he said in his evidence in chief? Uh, I agree with everything he said in his evidence in as much as I'm able to, so for the timeline that I was there. Some of his evidence deals with uh, traverses issues that happened after I left, after I was suspended, um, and I don't have any uh, personal knowledge of those issues. I want to pick it up from where you talk about the Mluli case um, t to an extent. You were the regional head, and, I, I, and the prosecutors who were dealing with the matter was Chris Smith and Jan Ferrara who reported to you. That's correct. Right? Did you have any hands-on involvement in the matter prior to having received communication from Advocate Mkwebi? No, not really. Um, Chris Smith is a very experienced prosecutor. Um, he's a senior state advocate um, of, of many, many years' experience. He's a, a good, solid prosecutor. Uh, he headed up the RAF co component of the SCCU in Randburg for many, many years. Uh, he certainly didn't need any help or direction from me. As a senior state advocate, he reported to Jan Ferreira, who was a deputy in my office. Uh, Jan himself is a, a very experienced prosecutor, a very competent prosecutor. Uh, he's also a very good administrator. He was the senior prosecutor, I think, in Boxburg or Benoni for quite a bit of time. He knows how to run an office. Um, they certainly didn't need any help or assistance from me dealing with the Mdluli matter. Um, I was peripherally aware of it. I knew that it was happening. It was sometimes in the news, and I was, took note of that. Uh, and I also knew that they were busy with the matter and, and that it had been enrolled, um, having consulted with the uh, Director of Public Prosecution, Sivan Gili, as was required, uh, both as a matter of uh, protocol and also as a matter of courtesy, because uh, dealing with a matter like Mdluli would certainly attract um, some interest and it, it would be embarrassing for um, Mr. Mzniati if he was asked about it and he had no idea of what was going on. So um, it was, at, um, all of us were, took a lot of trouble to keep him informed of high profile matters that, that may uh, attract attention so that he wouldn't be caught flat footed if he was asked about them. So in that sense he was, he, he had known about the Mdluli matter and he knew that it was enrolled and it was with his sanction that it was enrolled in his division. And, and you say you had an op there was a search and seizure that had taken place. Do you recall that? Uh, I recall it happening, yes. I had no um, involvement or input in it. Yeah. You, you had read the docket? Um, uh, the I had time. read the docket, certainly. Did you form a view about the matter? Uh, I certainly had. I thought there was a prima facie case. And I thought that uh, Mr. Mdluli had a case to answer. Um, I was not alone in that view. Uh, certainly Chris Smith held that view. Yeah, Jan Ferreira held that view. The investigating officer, uh, Colonel Rulofs, a man of uh, some, I have no idea, he's my age, so uh, many years' experience. Over 60 years or so. Um, 100, yeah. Um, <laughs> so he, he thought so, uh, and uh, most importantly, Svongile thought so.
uh, since he was the, the, the back stop effectively with him as the DPP. Before we go on on the Mluli matter, around the same time, um, there was a complaint emanating against you in relation to a matter which you were dealing with in Kimberley. And I don't want to go into great detail on the matter because you set it out in your Labour Court applications in great detail. But let's pick it up from saying there was a complaint by one of the persons involved in that litigation. And that complaint is made, if we pick it up in paragraph 40, the background you've briefly explained in your affidavit, where a Mr. Mendelo on behalf of ICT complains to the NPA um, about uh, uh, lodge a complaint about you. That is correct. I was unaware of the complaint, but I'm now aware of it. Yeah. No, no. You, you, we're talking about the first complaint, Advocate Breitenbach. Yes, I was unaware that he had complained until much later. Yes, yeah. not now, but yeah. much later. No, no, not no. at the time. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know about it then, but I do know now that that is what happened, yes. Right. And, and um, pursuant to that complaint, you were then summoned to a meeting. Is that That's correct? correct, yes. All right. And can you recall who attended that meeting? That's the meeting uh, on the 20th? It was a meeting on the 25th of November, and the only reason I remember that date is uh, it was my father's birthday. <coughs> so at that meeting, uh, as far as I can recall, was uh, Karen van Rensburg, Silas Ramiti, Shivangili Mizniati. I think that's all. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Right. Before we go into uh, the details of that meeting, preceding uh, that meeting, right? Um, you're not aware until um, much later <coughs> that um, Advocate Nguebe had received. Uh, no, sorry, I'm 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 mistaken. You get a, a memo from Advocate Nguebe asking, indicating to you that he had received representations in the Mluli matter, and he asks you to comment in respect thereof. Yes, he right? did. And oh. That, if we go to your bundle, is... No whispering, please. S we can't sorry, hear you. Sorry, sorry. Um, if you go into your bundle, you are forwarded the representations that's received from General Lamluli on the 21st of November, which is page number... Uh, uh, is it the second file? Uh... I don't know why you had have two files. Okay, so the first file is affidavit and one to ten. No, it's not that file. It's probably the other okay. file. All right. What am I looking for? It's the letter dated the 25th of November, 21st of November, 2011. My junior is just... Oh, okay, just a moment. I don't know that I have that. What the... <sighs> 21st of November, which year? Oh, there, um, 48. Just a moment. It would be on page 48. Oh. Right. Oh. Of a document? Uh, yeah, on a, on a specialised... Sorry, you would look at the bottom right-hand corner of the document for the page number. Uh, I think I have it, yes. It's right. a dated... 21 November 2011 on a SCCU letterhead. Yeah. Right. And this is a memo which you received from Advocate Mkwebi, to which the representations as received from Lieutenant General Mluli is attached. And he asks you for a report in respect thereof. Correct? 
Yes. What was your impression when you received this? Well, it was on the 21st of November. Um, as far as I was concerned, A, Mr. Mkhebi was not the head of the SECU. Um, and B, uh, I took mild offence that he was writing directly to me and not uh, writing to me via the DPP to whom I reported. Um, I thought that it showed a lack of respect towards the DPP to whom I reported. Uh, and I was concerned about the fact that he was inquiring about the Nglouli matter. Um, I had for some time expected uh, problems with the Nglouli matter. Uh, and uh, I held the view that um, when this letter came that uh, Mr. Mkhwebe was going to interfere in the Mluli matter. And why did you think that? Well, uh, Mluli was well connected. He was, uh, an imp he held a very important post in the, in the South African police. Um, there had already been a lot of uh, issues surrounding the investigation that the investigating officer had discussed with myself and uh, Ferreira and Smith. Uh, he was having a lot of difficulty getting uh, documents that he required in the investigation. He was having a lot of pressure applied to uh, not do a particularly good job. And he was, there were just obstacles being put in his way all the time. He was having a lot of trouble finalizing what really wasn't a terribly complex investigation. Now, at that time, I understand that there are now new facts uh, of which I was not involved. But at that time, it wasn't a particularly difficult matter. Um, and uh, and so, but of course there was a, a huge amount uh, to lose for Mr. Mluli. Uh, he was well connected. It was uh, no secret was made of the fact that he was well connected. And uh, so, I expected trouble in the Mluli matter. And uh, when this arrived, um, the trouble had arrived. Oh. It was hence on your instructions that Chris Smith uh, responded to the representations that was made and did not provide Advocate Mkhwebe with a docket? Uh, I told him that he should, under no circumstances, give uh, Mr Mkhwebe the docket, uh, that the original docket should remain with him, uh, and that he should supply Mr Mkhwebe with an electronic copy of the docket. And you then took charge of the docket? Uh, Smith then said, I'm not up for this, I've got children, I'm not interested in this kind of fight. Uh, we see what's happened to Rulofsa and the previous... There was, a, there was another investigating officer involved prior to that, for Lyon. Uh, he climbed out of the matter because he couldn't deal with the pressure. And, uh, and, and Smith just said, I'm not up for this. So I said, fine, just you know, give me the docket. Uh, and then Jan Ferreira and I uh, ran with the matter largely after that. Of course, we included Smith when we needed background information because he had been the most hands-on of the three of us. And... You then, under cover of a letter, and if you turn the page, you'll see the letter dated 24th November. You respond to the, you give a response to Advocate Mzanyati, and you send it to the special director as well, correct? Yes, it was drafted by Chris Smith, but um, both Ferreira and I were happy with the contents, yeah. Right. And then on the 25th, in paragraph 54, is the meeting to which you are summoned, at which... Uh, uh, Karen van Rensburg, Sibun Gilliam Zanyati, and Silas Ramaiti is present. That's correct. Right. Are you told what is the nature of the complaint at that meeting? Not at all. Do you ask? Certainly. What do you get told? Uh, I'm trying to remember the precise words because they were quite ludicrous, but I'm having trouble remembering, which was along the lines of, um, we can't tell you that. What did you think it was? Uh, I assumed it was uh, something to do with the Kumba matter because just uh, a few days prior to that, I had had a, a, a heated debate with the police about not supporting the investigating officer. They kept hanging her out to dry. She couldn't do all the work by herself. She's not capable of doing... Uh, civil work by herself. She has no expertise in that field, neither should she be expected to have. And they were providing no support. The legal department was not providing sufficient support. Uh, there didn't seem to be any urgency. Uh, Van Baek was quite often in tears about it. Um, 
the state attorney was doing an abysmal job and uh, and so I had I had said to the police that uh, and, and we had had a very heated discussion and um, not known for pulling my punches then or now um, and I said you know that they were disgracefully letting her down so I, I expected that the police had complained that I had lambasted them. What was proposed to you at that meeting? Well, I also asked who complained, uh, and I was also told that we can't tell you that either. Uh, I thought that was laughable. Uh, what was proposed was that I would be, that they would hold an investigation, to which I said that's absolutely fine. I don't think that I'm above any investigation. Go ahead and investigate um, to your heart's content. Um, but then they said they would move me to the DPP's office for the duration, and, and I would um, not be at the office of the SECU, and I would therefore also relinquish uh, all the matters that I was busy with, and I was busy with many matters. Um, uh, I, I like to prosecute, I like going to court, and I was, uh, a, I was not a, a regional head who sat in my office and directed people I prosecuted. And I refused, I said, absolutely not, I'm not prepared to give up my cases. Um, I'm not prepared to be moved to the DPP's office. That's finding me guilty before a hearing. Uh, give me a piece of paper. I'll resign right now. So they said, uh, could they have some time to talk it over? I left, waited outside. They called me back and said, okay, um, they don't want to, to go that route. Uh, I could go back to the SSU. I could carry on doing what I was doing. Would I agree to transfer the Kumba matter to another prosecutor. I said, absolutely, no problem at all. Uh, I'm very busy, I can do without it. And, uh, and I transferred, on the way back, I was driving back from the VGM building to the SECU, and uh, on the way back in the car, I called um, Paul Lowe and told him to take it over from me and, uh, and to collect the, the files out of my office. And I had nothing further to do with the matter after that. What do you know about what happened to the matter subsequently? I don't believe anything's happened to it. Um, what did you subsequently find out about the matter in um, relation to ICT? Well, at the time, we were aware that um, ICT was, at, at some point in its structure, held by, had, that, that Dudizani Zuma had an interest in it. We were aware of that at the time. Uh, but it now transpires that it was uh, Dudizani Zuma and the Guptas who, had, uh, who held the final interest in, in ICT. In your view as a prosecutor, what was the, what was the state of your case? Uh, I thought we had a very good case. Um, a lot of investigation had been done. There were some issues with, with some, of the, um, some of the IT stuff that had been seized in, in the warrant. We were uh, required to give back. We were still working on that issue. But a lot of analysis had been done on, on, the, on the information that we had seized, on the material that we had seized. Uh, and it was, a, it was really um, a bit of a slam dunk. Uh, it was obvious to, to even the most uninformed person that, um, that the tender proposal or application, or however you phrase it, I don't uh, really remember now, of, of Kumba had been copied. Um, it, was, it was painfully uh, amateurishly done, and uh, there was no doubt that there was a very strong case. Subsequent to this meeting on the 28th, you then get a, of November, the 28th of November, you then go back and you subsequently get another memorandum from Advocate Mkwebe and you see that at page 56 of the bundle. Yes. And he effectively asks you for the docket. A yes. summary of the docket and analysis yes, asks, um, together with the docket before yeah, the second he, of... He obviously wasn't happy with the, the job that we had done um, and he wanted more information and, uh, and the docket, yes. If you turn the page, you then responded to that memorandum yes. um, by providing him with more information and an electronic copy of the docket. Uh, those were my instructions. I believe he was given a an electronic copy of the docket, and we certainly provided the memorandum, yes. Yeah, if you, if you go a few pages under paragraph 3, there is a note that says that an electronic copy of the docket is attached here too. 
under bullet point three, um, and all the annexures, copies of the annexures are provided. Okay. If you then turn the page, um, further, the next two documents is the documents, the covering memorandum and the letter which you received from Advocate Mkwebe in which he says that the matter should be withdrawn. Oh, on which page are you? I'm sorry, I'm not uh, I'm, now, I'm now dealing with... Page 66. Yeah, 66. Okay, yes, I have it. Um, okay. We have a letter to you, 66 yes. and 67, yes. and that which goes to yeah. Advocate Mzanyati that you copied into up until 78. Indeed. Correct? Oh. That's correct. Oh. At the stage when you received this, were you aware of any communication that had gone uh, to the to Mluli's um, lawyers? No. Certainly not. Right. What did you do after receiving this? Well, I had a small stroke, uh, and I then went to see Sibongili Mizniati. And you deal with that at paragraph 64 of your affidavit? Yes. Uh, I went to, to see uh, Ms. Nyati. I still regarded myself as reporting to him. He was effectively my boss. Um, I, I was aware that he shared my view that there was a, a case against him really to be answered. I didn't believe for one moment that Mkhwebe was uh, entitled to withdraw the matter uh, or to give that instruction. And so um, I was uh, very indignant and went to... Um, Mzniati to show him the, the correspondence and to discuss a way forward. Uh, the matter was enrolled uh, under his direction in his division. He had original jurisdiction. And if he didn't agree to the withdrawal, then in my view, the matter could not be withdrawn. The, the, the final say was his. And I didn't uh, notice at all, and I was certainly not aware of any consultation that had taken place between Mkhwebi and Mzniati, uh, at which consensus was reached, reached to withdraw the matter. And he then asked you for a copy of the docket, which you then took to him. You took the docket to him. Uh, he asked for the docket, and I took him the docket, yes. By then, when this is going on, what's the state of the disciplinary matter against you? Have you heard anything? No, I don't think I'd heard anything, no. Colin von Rensburg had, off, had undertaken to supply me with uh, a letter uh, telling me, she said she would tell me what uh, the charges were and uh, and uh, or more information surrounding the charges and, and how the matter would um, be dealt with uh, so that, um, you know, this investigation could run and that, that uh, I knew what I had to do to make that happen. Uh, no such communication was received from her and I also discussed that with Sibongile. Um, I pointed out to him that I'd in fact drafted a letter for her that I wanted to send to her but because he was my immediate uh, boss and that he had been at the meeting, I discussed it with him and he suggested that I don't send the letter and that I just wait, which I then did. If you then go and see him again uh, a day or two later, is that correct? You yes, say in your affidavit at paragraph yeah. 66 on the 8th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he read the docket and then I went to see him again. Did he express a view to you? Oh, most certainly, he expressed the view that there was a that he still held the view that there was a prima facie case, uh, and that the prosecution should continue. Um, in a discussion with him, I then uh, I, I went to see, I met with um, General Jacobs and Brigadier van Graan from the um, legal department of the police. Uh, it was clear that uh, there had been no consultation with them as to the withdrawal of the charges, and and they were um, equally uncomfortable with the decision. You then, in your next paragraph, also went with them to go and see Advocate Jay Govender. Is that correct? Yes, we had wanted to see the Inspector General. Um, she was unavailable. She was in, in a meeting. and we, So, uh, Ms. Nyati, myself, and Van Gran then met with, with Jay Govender. She was the legal advisor to the IG. 
and um, it was the governor's view that they had no mandate to investigate uh, criminal matters, and um, and so that, that was the essence of that meeting. Because um, Zulofsa had, had, in his report, made it clear that there had been uh, many consultations with that office. Uh, and so that was just, uh, you know, making sure that we covered all bases uh, before we went to see Mr. Mkwebi to challenge his decision, because it was patently not correct. And the following day, which is uh, the 9th of December, you and Advocate Zinyati go and see him? Uh, yes. And um, what do you remember about that visit? <laughs> well, it was, I, th I think it was possibly uh, the first time that... Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I saw him... Uh, no, I did. I saw him after he was appointed. I certainly did. But uh, we, we went there, and he was sitting in his office at a long... He had a long conference table in his office, and he sat back at the head of the table like this, and he said, oh, Colleagues, I presume you're here to test my powers. And uh, quite frankly, I was not impressed. No. What then transpired at this meeting? Well, Ms. Nyati and I told him that we didn't agree with him. Uh, Ms. Nyati was, as always, a lot more tactful than I was. I think at some point I uh, may have said to Mr. Mkhibi that I thought he was quite mad. Um, Ms. Nyati was, uh, as I say, a lot more um, circumscribed in his approach. Uh, we told him we didn't agree with his decision. We told him that he didn't have the authority to make the decision, that there had been no consultation, that there was no consensus. Uh, and he replied by saying that I'm functus officio in this matter, and I've already told, and I've already sent a letter to Mglouli's uh, lawyers to say that the matter will be withdrawn. So that sort of took the wind out of our sails a bit. Uh, we had gone there certainly to fight. I had certainly gone there to fight. There was no doubt in my mind. Um, having been told that the uh, legal representatives of Mglouli had already been informed by what was then the, the uh, national head of the SECU, that the matter would be withdrawn. Um, it changed matters somewhat. Uh, the NPA was in a bad space. We were enduring bad publicity for a variety of reasons. Um, and I was, it was untenable to think of sending a prosecutor to court to say, the director of public prosecutions who enrolled this matter says the matter must go ahead. And the defense hop up and say, I have a letter from the special director who heads the ACCU who says the matter must be withdrawn. So in court, you will have a did, 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 did situation. It's uh, unseemly. It's unacceptable. It, it shouldn't happen. Uh, it would have done nothing to enhance the reputation of the National Prosecuting Authority. And so Ms. Nyati and I agreed, and it was a, a very definite agreement that the matter would be withdrawn on a provisional basis to sort out this impasse. So, uh, and that was, and that was that. Now, I, I'm sure that, uh, that I will be questioned on the existence or not thereof of a provisional withdrawal. Uh, and I can answer that then, or I can answer it now. I saw that you might was, as well answer it. I thought, saw that it was put to Jan, and, and uh, of course, it's correct. A withdrawal is a withdrawal, and that's that. Uh, but if you withdraw a matter, there's nothing preventing you from enrolling it later. So in that sense, every single withdrawal is a provisional withdrawal, unless the prosecutor gets up and undertakes not to enrol it again. That means that you're indicating that you're finished with it, and it will not be revisited. And that happens from time to time for a variety of reasons. Um, or, or if, uh, uh, you know, um, it would be unfair, unthinkable, and whatever in law to continue with the matter. But in, in a sense, every single withdrawal is, is a provisional withdrawal because nothing prevents you when, when a matter is withdrawn from re enrolling it. There was a distinction that was made which you didn't hear by Gerard Nell, who explained that under Section 6A is what prosecutors colloquially refer to as a provisional withdrawal, mm. and under 6B of the Criminal Procedure Act is where you, as a matter of law, can't, can't proceed. Can't proceed. Yeah. And he said that 
it was the former that everybody usually referred to as, as a, a yeah. provisional. Exactly. And so, yeah. while it is not perhaps a, a, a formally or technically correct legal term uh, in that sense, every single withdrawal, unless it's a final, final withdrawal, is a provisional withdrawal. And that is our, certainly how prosecutors refer to it. So, uh, and, and this, this one was most certainly viewed in that light. Uh, we had every intention of re-enrolling this matter as soon as this impasse had been sorted out and as soon as the issues that Mr. Mkwebe had surrounding the involvement or not of the IGI had been sorted out. Can I, before we go into the IGI, can I take you to page 79 um, of the bundle? Mm -hmm. This is the letter dated 4 December 2011. Yes. And, and I, I accept that there's a dispute as to whether the letter was wrongly dated or not. For the moment, leave that aside. Sure. Right? Um, did Advocate Mkhwebi give you a copy of the letter at the time? No. I don't believe so. If you could, for purposes of the record, as I've already indicated on a previous occasion, when you refer to a letter, identify it. You, you, the tendency is to say just page 77, did they give you a copy of the letter? It is usually helpful to say, this is a letter to so-and-so dated to us. Exactly. My apologies. I, I'm, uh, this is the letter from Advocate Mkhwebi to Lieutenant General and Luli's legal representatives indicating that the matter is to be withdrawn. It and appears I think to be, yes. You've answered that question. Oh. Right? Um, you mentioned now uh, the impasse. What did you understand needed to be done for purposes of? re enrolling the matter? Well, uh, Mr. McCreeby had raised issues about the um, ability of the police and the National Prosecuting Authority to deal with this matter. Uh, so there was a, a discussion with the Inspector General's Office in that regard uh, that needed to be sorted out. And, um, and then, of course, there was the issue that existed between Mr. Mzinyati and, and Mr. McCreeby uh, about whether or not they agreed even, you know, having the matter having been withdrawn, it would be with Sibongile holding the view that there was a prima facie case and that Mzuli had a case to answer, uh, it would be untenable to, to proceed as if he didn't exist. So having withdrawn the matter on, with what I certainly understood to be an agreement that it was provisional in order to sort this out for, for uh, Mr. Mkhwebi then to give an instruction that the matter was, was uh, finally withdrawn and that as far as he was concerned it was uh, closed, finalized, finished, done with, um, as if uh, Ms. Nyati wasn't entitled to be consulted and had a view. Um, that's just not how you operate. Now, we don't do things like that in the MPA. You know, uh, they, they are rank equals um, and we, we, that, that situation needed to be dealt with. Tell me if the letter had not gone off, off to Lieutenant General Mluli's attorneys indicating mm. that the matter would be withdrawn. What would, the out, what, do you, what would your position have been in respect of whether it should be withdrawn or not? Uh, my position would have certainly been that the matter cannot possibly be withdrawn. That there's a case to answer. There's no, no, absolutely no grounds to withdraw it on, certainly not in the representations. And, uh, and that um, unless... Somebody gave me a written instruction to withdraw it, which I, uh, which I would later have disputed in any event. I would have taken that on. Um, I would not have withdrawn the matter. And I don't believe Sibungidi would have either. He was very firm in his view that there was a prima facie case and that uh, Mluli had a case to answer. And whatever the outcome of that matter was, everyone would have been happy with. But the fact of the matter is the NPA is required to prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice, regardless of who the accused is. And so if Mr. Mluli was acquitted at the end of it, that criminal trial, nobody would have worried about that. That's fine. That's how life works. We're all big here. But you, you cannot not prosecute people for, for reasons that are not sound in law. Can I, at this stage, just get to know what was the role of... Uh the NDPP or acting NDPP at the time regarding all this to and froing of uh, the withdrawal proceeding, the issues around the Mdluli case. 
Um, my lady, I'm, I'm not sure if she knew about it. I don't know if Mr. Mkhrebi informed her. Uh, as far as I'm personally concerned, uh, she probably didn't know about it at all. Unless she, unless she read what, what of it was in the news. Uh, but uh, at that stage, she was not yet involved. Um, uh, you know, it was an issue between my office. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I certainly didn't inform her, and I have no reason to believe that she knew. Thank you. Maybe if it would assist the presiding officer's advocate, she was not yet appointed as the acting NDPP. This yeah. is the period in the first week of December, and she gets appointed on the 22nd of December. But it is why I ask about the NDPP at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever the NDPP yeah, was, I've got no reason to believe that they were apprised yeah. of the situation. No. Okay, thank you. As, as I understand it, at the risk of giving evidence here, on the 1st of December, the SEA hands down a judgment um, which sets aside Advocate Samalani's appointment as NDPP um, at that stage. And I'm not sure as to what date he vacates the office, but I think the evidence was from Advocate Jan Ferreira, that when this is going on, there is actually nobody in the NDPP office. Does that That's ring helpful. a bell, Advocate uh, That's entirely possible, yes. I think, I think that was the situation. There was a time when there was uh, yeah. sort of nobody. Yeah. It certainly seems like that. Thank you. Are you aware at the time when this meeting takes place um, in the office with Advocate Mkhwebe and Advocate Mzinyati that Advocate Mkhwebe has been charged or been, yes, not charged, it's a, uh, he's been given the responsibility of looking at the complaint that had been lodged against you? Uh, no, I was not aware of it. Um, Mr. Mzinyati made no mention of that fact to me at all. The position that had been adopted in much of what has been said in the public domain and affidavit by Advocate Mkwebe has been, I gave Advocate Breitenbach certain instructions of matters that had to be taken care of before the matter could be re-enrolled at this meeting on the 9th of December, and she didn't do anything about it. And that's what's caused the delay in this matter going back to court. What is your comment on that? Uh, well, I, I don't believe he, he gave me any instructions of that day um, for two reasons. One, I don't, he, he didn't, but secondly, I don't believe he was in a position to give me instructions. Um, I, was, I reported directly to Sibungili Mizniati. He was sitting in the room. Uh, Mr. Mkhwebi could not possibly give me instructions while the person that I reported to was sitting in the room. Um, the SEC resorted under the DPP's office, and the instructions to me had to come via Sibungili Mizniati, no other way. Uh, and um, that was not the nature of the conversation on that day. Um, there was an impasse that needed to be resolved. Um, one of the issues was we would uh, take it up with the office of the IGI, that I do recall. Uh, and the other issue was that, um, that, uh, that the... The, the problem that related to the DPP's view and the special director's view that were, 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 were not divergent uh, or not in confluence with each other um, had to be resolved. Uh, and that was something that, that I couldn't do. It was something that the two of them had to do. The matter was taken up with the office of the IGI. She did later um, respond in writing. Uh, she made it very clear that her office accepted had no mandate to do criminal investigations, that they did not replace the National Prosecuting Authority in any sense. And in any event, the, the, the contents of the docket at that stage, I understand that to be somewhat different now, um, but, uh, but at that stage, uh, there was nothing that prevented the South African police from investigating those issues, and there was nothing preventing the National Prosecuting Authority from prosecuting those issues, in my view. If I take you to page 111 in the bundle, which is the letter from Lieutenant General Dramat in his capacity as the head of the 
Director for Priority Crime Investigation um, to Advocate Jiba. Um, and that's dated 23rd of March 2012. Um, and attached to that letter is the uh, letter which you find at 109, which is the letter from the IG to SAPS. That's correct. Right. And as I understand it, that response came about because you had forwarded um, or had provided SAPS with the memorandum which Advocate Mkwebe had prepared dated 4 December. Yes. Correct? Yes. I gave it to uh, a general, I think he was a general then, he may have been a brigadier then, uh, Kuban Moodley, and uh, because the, the matter had to be resolved. This issue that Mr Mkwebe had with the IGI had to be resolved. Um, uh, Kuban Rulofsa, the investigating officer, uh, failed to understand the problem, and I had a discussion with Moodley and gave him the he was uh, Rulofsa's superior officer, and I gave him the memorandum, and they, they had to deal with it because it was one of the things that needed to be dealt with. They did deal with it, and this was the result. And then if I take you to page 114 in the bundle, which mm. is the memorandum from Advocate Mkwebe yes. to yourself and Advocate Mzanyati dated 27th mm. March 2012, um, and it confirms that the day prior there to at about two o'clock you delivered the correspondence which I just referred you to to both his office and to Advocate Jibas. Um, uh, yes, um, I actually um, took it to him because I needed to get, uh, I had been to Ms. Nyati and he had said go, I can't, I'm not going to instruct you on the way forward, uh, speak to Mkwebi, so I went to Mkwebi. What happened when you saw him, Kwebi? Did you see him or did you just leave the document? I honestly don't recall. Um, but he did write me a letter to complain that I'd given his document to the police. That's the document at uh -huh. page 114. That's correct. Which is the memorandum uh -huh. where he says he hasn't taken a decision. Uh -huh. um, uh, he queries the letter from the Inspector General as being an alleged letter? Yes, quite. Um, uh, and then he says that nobody in his office or in the office of the acting NDPP had corresponded with either the police or the office of the Inspector General. Uh. Um, and then he tackles you on having provided a confidential document to the police and the Inspector General. Yeah. Um I found it mildly irritating and a little strange. You know, the prosecution and the police work together very closely, um, of necessity. The police investigate, prosecutors prosecute, and, and a lot of the work uh, overlaps. And if I want the police to do something, I have to give them something to do it with. This issue had to be uh, re resolved with the Office of the IGI, um, and, and, and that was what we were busy doing. Um, normally, prosecutors don't have anything to hide from the investigating officer. It's a, it's a, of necessity, a reasonably a close relationship with a common goal. So, I at the time saw no difficulty giving them the memorandum. I did, however, I see it's not in here, but I did write back to uh, Mr. Mkhwebi either by way of a letter or by an email, and I apologised if I offended him. But um, uh, I didn't really see any other way of dealing with the issue. It may well have been an email which we didn't have access to, Possible, but we, yeah. we didn't see that. Yeah. When disciplinary steps was eventually taken against you, was the disclosure of this letter one of the charges? No. Right, and then I take you to 119 of the documentation, which is the... Oh. Actually, before I do that, there's a letter, at, there's a memo at 117, which Advocate Mkwebi sends to you, dated 30 March 2012. It goes to you, Advocate Mzanyati, and Lieutenant General Dramat. Yes. Right? And I um, want to take you to paragraph 2, where he advises you that the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence has no oversight functions and powers with regard 
to prosecutorial decisions. Isn't that precisely what the di dispute was about? Most certainly. Um, that, was the, that was the view of Ms. Niati and myself initially. It doesn't seem to have been the view of Mr. Mkhwebi initially, but it certainly was uh, what he articulated in this letter. It's mildly bizarre. Um, but nobody suggested that the IGI had any oversight functions or powers of review with regard to prosecutorial, prosecutorial decisions. In fact, quite the opposite is true, and everybody knows that, you including the IGI. You then take it to paragraph 4 of the letter. The NPA took a principled and considered decision on this matter without fear, favor, or prejudice. Yeah, right. Sorry? I said, yeah, right. What does that mean? It means I don't agree as it is required to do in terms of the law. You, you don't agree for reasons you've already stated. That's correct. That decision stands and this matter is closed. Mm. What did you understand by that? I understood that to mean that the decision to withdraw the matter was now final, that uh, no further correspondence needed to be entered into, uh, that the matter was closed, it would not be re-enrolled, and that mm. it was, in the view of Mr. Mkhwebi, uh, a finalized matter, finished, done. Uh, and I was not happy. And then I take you to what is then on page 119. Mm -hmm. This is the memorandum which you and Advocate Ferrara prepared. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. Was, was this done in secret or did, was it commonly known that you were doing it? Well, this was certainly not done in secret. Um, it took us quite a while to do it. We put a lot of thought and effort into it. Uh, we took it very seriously. Uh, we circulated it um, amongst some of my colleagues to get their views. Certainly the other regional, some of the other regional heads. I don't know if we did to everybody, but I, I certainly recall myself discussing it with, with some of the regional heads at a co conference we had in Johannesburg, um, giving it to them to look through. Uh, before we before we delivered it, uh, we we pondered on it for quite some time. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't something that we did lightly. Now, Advocate Ferreira couldn't recall, but can you remember? You sent this <coughs> memorandum to Advocate Mkhwebi, at Dr. Amaiti, Mr. Hofmeyer, Advocate Mohatla, and Advocate Mzanyati. You addressed it to them. Yes. Um, what was the thinking behind that? Well, it was. It was addressed to Advocate Jeeba because she was then the Acting National Director of Public Prosecutions and I wanted her to, to uh, exercise her powers to review the decision of Mr. Mkhwebi. Uh, it was then also directed to Advocate Mkhwebi because it concerned him uh, and I wasn't, uh, we had no intention of doing it behind his back. So we took it to him, we gave it to him personally and told him what it was about so that he would know um, and so that he could you know, prepare a reply to, to Advocate Jiba should she require one. Um, Ramiti Hofmeyer and Mukatla were uh, Deputy National Directors at the time. Uh, and so as a matter of uh, protocol and courtesy, it was sent to them as well. Um, one would assume that a matter of this nature should be discussed um, with the senior management, and so we wanted to place each of them in a cop with a copy. And to Advocate Mzniati, because he was integrally uh, involved in this process. Um, the case was placed on the roll initially under his jurisdiction, uh, with his consent. And, um, and at this time, um, I still reported to Advocate Mzniati. So he knew about this memorandum before it was delivered. Uh, we took him a copy of the memorandum, again, um, for a variety of reasons, most importantly being uh, he was the person we reported to, and so we d wouldn't do things behind his back. And he needed to be informed if he was uh, asked about it, um, so that he wouldn't be caught, uh, you know, flat-footed and not know what was going on. Right. Now... Advocate Ferrara is pretty sure you took this memorandum on the 23rd of April, and you're pretty sure you took it on the 24th of April. I am pretty sure, but I'm, I, I'm not in a position to argue. Uh, it could be either I... Today, I don't recall. 
and your more contemporaneous documents at the time when you prepared your affidavits, say 24 April. Yeah, so um, that's based on what happened then. Um, today I couldn't argue with anybody about the date. Okay. And you do recall having given the document off to somebody at the time, a lady in the office? Uh, so, so on behalf of Elfka uh, Jiba, certainly. Um, she wasn't in the office. Uh, we went to look for her. Um, uh, Ferreira and I both went to the head office and we uh, walked around for some time looking for her. We couldn't find her. I eventually found uh, a lady called Sylvia, who I'd known for many years from the DPP's office. I, I, I honestly don't recall her surname. She's been with the NPA for many, many years. <coughs> uh, she agreed to uh, take the, the document and to give it to Advocate Jiba when she saw her. Um, she later, during my disciplinary, came to chat to me and told me that she'd gotten into serious trouble uh, for, for accepting the doc document on behalf of Advocate Jiba. We handed uh, Mr. Mkwebi a copy. He said that he would circulate it to the Deputy National Director, so we didn't have to bother. Um, however, we I don't recall if we went to Willie Hoffman's office or if we uh, met him somewhere in the passages, and we certainly gave him a copy. Right. Now, I don't know if, um, if uh, Dr. Amite or Advocate Mukhatla ever received uh, a copy. I have no idea. Right. You, the response that you then receive is to be found, um, comes to you, it's at 1.43, and it's it's dated the 26th of April, 2012. And it goes okay. to Advocate Mzinyati, Advocate Ferrara, and yourself. That's correct. Correct? Oh. And in that, uh, you are imparted certain information. Um, were you aware of anybody being used or abused for any purpose unconnected with the promotion or advancement of the interest of justice as reflected in this letter. No. I'm looking at the, the second page of the letter in the second paragraph. No. Were you aware uh, of any purported improper exercise of investigated powers on the part of the police? No. Were you aware of any purported exercise of improper prosecutorial functions by prosecutors? No. Were you apprised thereof at any stage between your meeting on the 9th of December and the 26th of April by Advocate Mkwebi? Certainly not. If I had been aware of it, I would have done something about it. Were you told, and he draws a distinction between acts of maladministration and acts of criminality, did you have any idea what he was talking about? None whatsoever. As far as I was concerned, the docket referred to acts of criminality. When he tells you since the initial decision must be accepted unless we choose to be deliberately ignorant in this regard, and it appears to be the case in your document that nothing had changed in the so-called case against the Mluli and Barnard, what is your comment on that? Well, in my view, nothing had changed. Um, up to then, the docket was uh, uh, revolved around uh, the purchase of motor vehicles in a, in a fashion that was uh, uh, deeply suspect. So. Um, I was not aware that anything else had changed, um, I, and I had no idea what he was referring to. When he talked about the obvious illegal actions on the part of the police in accessing classified privileged information and placing same through certain newspapers in the public domain, contrary to the law, uh, making the case of the state suspicious. I have no idea what he's referring to. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the police having obtained or accessed classified or privileged information. Uh, if the police uh, voluntarily hand over documents from one police department to another police department, uh, I don't know how that falls into this category. Uh, and I'm not aware of any police uh, placing information in the public domain by way of newspapers or any other way. Um, and if there was evidence like that, then I certainly wasn't aware of it and nobody told me about it. So when he says he'd been provided with further information on the matter and having been privy to classified confidential and high-level discussions with police management. He was concerned that our actions, I presume that's the NPA's actions in the matter, may be interpreted justifiably so as amounting to serious abuse of the legal process and motivated by ulterior purposes. 
I've got no idea on what he based that view or what the conversations were about. We were certainly not uh, informed or included. He then says the above view or conclusion is in addition to considerations of absence of admissible evidence and where evidence had been that had been admissible had been compromised. Don't know what he's talking about. He then goes on and he says it's a known fact that the Auditor General examined the information. Were you aware of any known facts about the Auditor General's involvement? Uh, I most certainly was not. Um, and then he takes the view that it's not in the interest of justice for the NBA to be involved and that it's appropriate functionary for the Inspector General to handle the matter. I could not agree less. Right. Now, that's the 26th of April that you get that, correct? Yeah. Right. Yes, sir, from the document, yes. So let me take you back to the beginning of that year, which is January. You've had that meeting on the 9th of December. Uh -huh. You've had a, a meeting in respect of which a disciplinary complaint is raised against you. By early 2012, have you heard anything about this disciplinary complaint? No, nothing at all. Um, nothing, heard nothing about it. Received nothing from um, uh, Corinne von Rensburg with regards to the complaint, nor to her, the way forward. No, nothing. Were you aware at the time um, that Advocate Mkhwebi had provided Advocate Jiba with a memo dated uh, 12 January 2012, um, in which uh, and that's at page 82 of the bundle, um, in which he had made certain recommendations. I was not aware of it. Can I just take you so that I can identify the documents mm -hmm. properly? I have it. Um, give it to me, I don't have it in here. This is a memorandum which Advocate Mkhwebi writes to Advocate Chiba in relation to the Kumba iron ore complaint. That's correct. Right. And I want to take you to page 89 of the bundle which deals with his conclusions after he had considered this complaint. Mm. So on January 12, 2012, he concludes that there's prima facie evidence not only of serious misconduct but also possible commission of a crime of defeating or obstructing the course of justice or attempts to do so exist in the matter. Yes. It is suggested that this matter not only be subject to an internal disciplinary inquiry, but a criminal investigation must be instituted. Mm. That being the case, the continued presence of the implicated official in the workplace as she is in possession or in a position to have access to all the information that is naturally crucial to the investigations, particularly her computers and phone records, becomes very relevant. I see that. And he then makes the recommendation that the integrity management unit must be instructed to open a criminal case against you. When was the criminal case actually opened against you? I have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm going to just check on the chronology. But it certainly wasn't opened in January 2012, correct? I, I, I really don't know. Um, I learned much later that a criminal case had been opened. But I had no idea at the time, and I don't recall now, yeah. That immediate steps be taken to secure, safeguard the evidence a, in your uh, position? Just a minute, just a minute. You learnt later that a criminal matter has been instituted against you. I think... And uh, you don't remember now when it was. Uh, I, don't, I don't... At least um, when you, when you learnt of it. I don't remember, I don't believe I even knew, even now, when it was in fact uh, instituted or laid. But I think during my disciplinary hearing, and perhaps my attorney can help me, it became, uh, I learned about the, fact, the existence thereof for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what, came, what became of the criminal? Uh, yes, I was prosecuted. Yes. Yeah. And acquitted. But you don't, you don't remember when uh, uh, it was instituted? When the prosecution started, um, I'm sure my attorney can help me. January 2016, my lady. Um, but when the, ch when the complaint was laid at the police, I have no idea. Yeah. I have that date somewhere. I will check it during the lunch adjournment so that we're not delayed. 
um, Advocate Mgwebi then recommended that the integrity management unit must be instructed to open a criminal case of defeating or obstructing the course of justice or attempts to do so for investigation. That immediate steps be taken to secure safeguard evidence in your possession. Did you have any evidence in your possession relating to the, the, the matter come January 2012? Uh, to which matter are you The ICT doing? matter. Um, yeah, I must have had. I had... You had I'm given sure the I file had... over to Paul. No, no, so? I'm sure there was correspondence stuff still on my computer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there was stuff on my computer. All, all the correspondence on my emails, etc., was there. Yeah. And other documents too that had been saved. But you know, I had uh, no interest in them. Uh, I, I must uh, confess to being a very sloppy administrator myself. So, on no. my computer, you will find many thousands of things, and it's all on my desktop because I don't know what else to do with it. And, and I misfile things all the time. That, that of course, mm. disqualifies you for the job of NDPP. That's why I withdrew. Okay. Um. And thirdly, that the police investigators appointed to investigate the matter shall be decided okay. at the highest level of the police, as Glennis is well connected with a number of police officials, particularly the Hawks. Oh, I see oh. that. Man that the current matter in consultation with the police be allocated to a new investigator and a new prosecutor be assigned to the matter. You see that? I see it, yes. Right. By, by that stage, it had already been allocated to a new prosecutor. The Kumba matter? Yes. It was allocated on the 25th of November of the previous year. Right. right. Um, and I had absolutely nothing to do with it since then. I made no inquiries. I never asked the prosecutor what uh, progress he was making. I had no interest in the matter. So, uh, in January 2012, as far as Advocate Gwebi was concerned, you, there was a prima facie case against you for obstructing justice, uh, for acts of criminality, and that you had to face disciplinary proceedings. Yes. And that you should be suspended without any access to that. Yeah, I see, sir. On the 1st of February, you still don't, you don't know about this and you hear nothing further in January? No, I knew nothing about it okay. and I heard nothing about it. On the 1st of February, um, you then, yeah, there's an announcement made um, that you had been suspended, correct? Yes, as far as I can recall, I was on leave at that time and I was in fact playing golf. And some and my colleagues started phoning me and saying, "You've been suspended for what?" Uh, and I uh, also had no idea. Uh, that's the, to the best of my recollection. I'm, I may be incorrect about being on leave, but I certainly started getting calls from from people saying, "Why have you been suspended? What's going on?" And uh, I had absolutely, I had not heard the announcement, <clears throat> and I had no idea what was happening. Uh. You then hired. A I'm I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Why were you playing golf with your phone on? <laughs> it's an unforgivable sin. <laughs> it's it's a I case thought. of fear of missing out. Mm. <laughs> so you probably were interested <laughs> in what was going on about your case. Uh, right. I seldom put my phone off. <laughs> You then engage the services of Mr. Wagner, um, and he then you ask him to contact the NPA to find out what's going on. Correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. I was I was certainly not in Pretoria, um, and he then went to find out what was going on. Mm. Were you at that stage aware of the details of the complaint that had been lodged? No. And I'm not going to take you there too, because all the correspondence which then ensues between your attorney and the... NPA is a next this annexures to your founding affidavit in your high in your labor court application, correct? Yes. Um, on the second of February, your attorney is then provided with a notice of intention to suspend, and you are told you have forty eight hours to give reasons why you shouldn't be suspended. That's correct. correct. Right. Um, and that notice was dated the first of February. Correct. I believe you, yes. Right. 
and did it, it didn't obtain any nature of, it didn't provide you with any details of the exact nature of the alleged abuse of power. It provided no, de no, no details at all. Um, and you then in your affidavit, and I'm now at paragraph 80, say your attorney then goes off seeking details. <coughs> yes, there was a protected correspondence. Um, my attorney is a fond letter writer. And um, there's protected correspondence trying to ascertain what the uh, nature of the complaint was so that I could uh, answer it. In the meantime, in Kimberley, where the ICT Kumba matter is going on, mm -hmm. there is then an application brought, correct? Yes. And there are allegations made in that application about alleged wrongdoing on your part. That's correct. And you then seek the permission to file an affidavit in that matter, um, which you permission is then granted and you then file that affidavit. That's correct. I got permission from Mr. Mkhwebe. Right. And when do you become aware that um, uh, Hercules Vasaman from the NPA Integrity Management Unit is then appointed to investigate the charges against you? Um, I don't um, recall the date myself. Um, I see it's in the in my affidavit that um, that uh, there was a meeting on the seventh of February, twenty eleven. I don't independently recall that date. Uh, where Vasaman and, a, and a probably five or six other people, I don't remember all of them now, uh, came to my office, uh, told me that they were busy with this, they'd been tasked with this investigation, uh, and as far as I recall, they asked for my laptop. Um, there'd been a spate of uh, break-ins at the SECU offices in Pretoria where laptops had been stolen. Um, we subsequently discovered that people were entering through, we shared a joint building with um, Home Affairs and the people were climbing onto the ledge outside Home Affairs and then shuffling their way along and opening the windows of the SECU and stealing computers. So at that time the instruction was you either take your laptop with you wherever you go or you make sure that it's locked away in a drawer. Um, most times I took the laptop with me. Uh, at that point my laptop was, uh, was not with me, it was at home. And um, so that was that was the reason I didn't immediately give it to him. And then there's a spat which develops about the uh, laptop being handed over um, and there's a going back and forth between your attorney and the NPA in respect of the laptop which we can see from the correspondence. That, um, is, that is correct. I was always happy to give them the laptop and I would, if I'd had it with me that day I'd probably have given it to them immediately. But I had um, appointed Mr. Wachenauer to advise me, and uh, therefore I took his advice, and his advice was that constitutionally I had a right of privacy, and that the NPA, A, must tell us what the nature of the complaint is against me, and B, must undertake to not violate my privacy with regards to the laptop, so not trawl through my personal information. And his advice was to not hand over the laptop until those two conditions had been met. And that's what the spat was about. And a meeting then ensues on the 18th of April, which you referred to in paragraph 88 of your affidavit. And it's at that meeting where yes. you, six months after the complaint emerges, mm. you provided with a copy of the complaint. Yes, uh, well, not a complete copy. Mr. Wasserman uh, arrived and... Amongst uh, other things we discussed, he handed us a copy of ICT's um, letter of complaint, but with no annexures, which made it largely worthless. Advocate Bauer, it seems we need a break for the recording. Uh, so can we just uh, get about five minutes, a five-minute break, just so that uh, the tape can be reinserted, whatever. Five minute break. If anybody goes out, kindly be back within four minutes. Thank you.
You may proceed. Be before the adjournment, we were at the adjournment. A meeting which ensued on the... Uh, I'm going to have to uh, refresh my memory. Um, I think, again, I said that we would, um, we would hand it over. It was, it was always our uh, position that we would hand it over once we had been provided with the... Oh, sorry, uh, Advocate Breitenbach, I think I'm misleading you. The yeah. meeting which I'm referring to with the agreement is on the 30th of April, which comes later, uh, which, which where the agreement is then made about the Murray. Oh, where, which, where, where, the, where yes. they serve the suspension letter on me in inverted commas. That's yeah. correct. Sorry, let me, uh, okay. let me not mislead you, which is why I'm... Um, I did that. Okay. Right. On, on the 30th of April, um, uh, when I got to the office, there were two gentlemen from the NPA waiting to see me. Um, I think it was Mr. Taba and Mr. Ramahana. I knew them both. Um, they handed me a brown envelope uh, in which there was a letter that appeared to be from uh, Ms. Jiba uh, suspending me. Um, I called Mr. Wagner and said to him that I'd been handed this document and that uh, I required him to come to my office, which he did. Um, Mr. Klaba and Mr. Ramahana asked for my laptop. The 30th was sort of an odd kind of a day in between a weekend, I think, and a holiday. Um, I had meetings largely out of the office on that day. There were very few staff members in the office. Most of them had taken leave because the 1st of May was a public holiday. Um, certainly when I was there with them, I was there much earlier than anybody else, and there was nobody there, not even my secretary. And my secretary was there. I beg your pardon, she was there. So um, they asked for my laptop. I didn't have it with me. Uh, we made an arrangement to, um, to go and fetch it. I think I said that they could go with me to fetch it. It was at home. I seem to recall that. Um, and Mr. Kaba indicated that he wasn't prepared to go to my home because I have large dogs. Uh, so uh, Mr. Wachenard and I then went to collect the computer. And they, they took away my um, access tag so I couldn't open the door and also my office keys. Um, we went to fetch the, the laptop. We met them back at the office. Um, at Mr. Wagner's office? No, at my office, at the SSU. Um, we then, um, in the absence of an agreement, we still require, we've now been given the complaint but no annexures, uh, so we were not able to answer that yet. Um, and in the absence, there was, there was still no agreement about the, the respect for privacy and an undertaking to not trawl through my, my private information. So the, the way we uh, agreed to overcome that issue was that we would make, uh, uh, that we would delete my private information. So I would delete my Gmail account uh, and we would delete um, other personal information on the laptop. Uh, uh, that was certainly agreed to by, there was another gentleman there from the MPAs, I think he was the IT guy, uh, Mr. Swartz. Um, so we, uh, we agreed that at, at my expense we would get a, an IT person in who could, um, could do this, because I certainly don't know how. And, um, and at that point, uh, I don't know if it's changed now, but at that point Mr. Wachner was certainly um, incapable of doing anything with a computer. I don't even think he could switch one on. Um, I, I don't know if it's changed in the interim. Um, so we got a, a, a guy, some computer expert, in to come and do this job. Uh, there were NPA people present. I think Mr. Kaba was still there. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think Mr. Ramahana had left. But NPA people were in and out all day. Uh, I had no access to the office without them because I didn't have keys and I didn't have a, a card to swap. Um, but to cut it short, they were making a mirror image of your Well, they were drive. making a forensic mirror image, yes. So and what happened to that mirror image? Well, what we did initially is I, I brought the computer to the office. I plugged it into the local area network so that it could back up the contents of the computer to the server. It's not, a, it's not an automatic uh, thing. You have to actually plug it in. It's not via Wi-Fi. So I plugged in the local area network cable, backed it up to the server, I created a folder for my personal information, uh, and then he, no, I didn't create the folder. He then 
made a mirror image. So that entails quite a long process. You put a write block on the computer so you don't change any of the properties, and then you you back up the hard drive. So it takes a long time. Um, I was in and out of my office. I spent some time in the library, which is opposite my office. Um, there's no need for anybody to really just sit and watch it happen. There's nothing you can do about it so while it's happening. So when this process was done, what did you do? When and it was finalised. Yeah. Um, when, you, when he started making the copies, I asked Mr. Swartz if he wanted a copy. Uh, he said no, they don't need it. Um, they have everything on the server. So uh, when that was finalised, I m created the folder, put the personal stuff that I wanted to delete into that folder and told him to delete it. Um, he couldn't do that because you, I didn't have the um, administrative uh, authority to, to, to perform that function on a computer. Um, neither did anybody in the office. Um, so Mr. Swartz then phoned the, the VGM for, to speak to the administrator and get a password that would allow them to do that. He couldn't get hold of me. He phoned two or three times. Uh, they couldn't get hold of the person. It was the day before a public holiday, it was late in the afternoon, and there was just no one available. So we then agreed that I would take the computer home with me, which I did, that we would meet at Mr. Bachner's office the next day, because I had no access to my office, um, and that uh, the IT guy would then delete that folder uh, the next day. Um, as I recall, Mr. Kaba was going to also come to Mr. Bachner's office for this exercise so that he could... Uh, be present and, and be comfortable about what we were doing. Um, on the morning of the first, he wasn't there. We found him. Um, as far as I can recall, he said that he had family commitments and he wasn't able to come, that we should go ahead without him, which we then did. The folder was deleted, uh, and I, I, w I was going away on holiday, uh, I think, and I left. No, 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 no that was before, sorry. So then, then, then we got him the computer. Uh, I, my, I left, and uh, Mr. Wachner uh, gave Mr. Taba the computer the next day, as far as I remember, so, he came to collect it. Uh, but prior to that, there was a complete backup of your laptop onto the NBA server, oh, yes. so they effectively had the contents thereof, yes, together the, with your personal Whatever was on the server and whatever was on the mirror image was identical. Yeah. Now, when you wrote this memorandum off to Advocate Jibach, which you and Advocate Ferrara sent off. Or what were you seeking to achieve? Um, I was hoping that she would uh, use her authority as the acting national director to uh, review uh, the case in its entirety, um, have a look at the docket, have a look at all the correspondence, and, um, and come to the conclusion that Ms. Nyati and Ferrara and I had come to that there was in fact a case for uh, Mr. Mluli to answer, that she would overrule the what I thought was a poor decision by Mr. Mkwebi and instruct that the prosecution go ahead. In your affidavit, in paragraphs 94 and 95, you summarize your concerns, and in 96, you summarized your conclusion. Did Advocate Chiba in any way uh, Lee Hayes with you in respect of this memorandum? Not at all. In fact, it was just a few days thereafter that you were served with your notice of suspension, correct? That's correct, yes. So the only communication which you received in response to your memorandum is what you got from Advocate Mkwebi dated the 30th of April to which I had taken you earlier. That's correct. Subsequent to that, or before I do that, I took you to, and you see that on paragraph 101 of your affidavit on page 34. Um, during the course of my consultations with you, I showed you the affidavit which Advocate Jiba deposed to in the GCP matter, and I inquired from you as to the protracted settlement negotiations which had ensued prior to the 23rd of April. What is your comment in respect to that? Uh, if there were any, I was certainly unaware of them. And they were conducted with someone other than myself. Did you give your attorney any instructions to conduct settlement negotiations on your he behalf? He was involved in no settlement negotiations. So what, in your view at that time, would have been any reason for a delay in your suspension between when January and April 
of 2012. If it was based on the Kumba matter, none whatsoever. I was there, I was available, I was in my office. Everybody knows where I live, everybody knew where I worked. There was nothing preventing anybody from suspending me. There's also been a suggestion made that you were aware of a suspension letter to be served on you on the 23rd of April and you ducked out and avoided being served in that regard. Um, yeah, that, that is uh, patently incorrect. Uh, I was not aware of any suspension letter. If I had been, I would have gone to fetch it. Uh, I'm not known for ducking out of anything. And as far as the allegation is concerned that you had been charged with tasks that you had not carried out, um, which you see on the page 101.5, the allegation is that the specific tasks you were charged with is not clear, but it, it, it goes back to the question I asked you earlier on, that you were holding up the finalization of the investigation in the Mruli matter. I disagree. So let's assume you were charged with tasks. What would you have done having left the meeting of the 9th of December if between you, Advocate Mzanyati, and Advocate Mkwebi, there was an agreement that this matter was going to be provisionally withdrawn and you needed to do ABC? What would, what would you in I, the ordinary course do? I would have done my very best to ensure that they were completed as quickly as possible so that the matter could be enrolled again as quickly as possible. I viewed it as a matter that was important for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and it was certainly my view that it should be on the roll as soon as possible. And I believe that Advocate Mizniati shared that view. Were you aware at the time that Advocate Jiba had signed a memorandum um, um, approving your suspension on the 2nd of March 2012? I was not. You, you had been served with this letter of suspension and you were told um, prior there too that you could make representations up until the 25th of April, is that correct? That's correct, yes. So effectively by the time you got served with this, it was prior to the deadline of the 25th? Certainly it was. And what did you make of that? Well, bearing in mind the... Um overwhelming coincidence of the memorandum that we delivered and the timing of the suspension uh, and the fact that I had not yet uh, replied to as I was entitled to, um, I formed the conclusion that the suspension letter had been backdated to avoid the inference that um, it had been signed as a result of the memo. You then subsequently brought two Labour Court applications um, in relation to your suspension, that's correct? That's correct. And the findings of the Labour Court was that it was premature to be in that court, that there was okay. a disciplinary proceeding yes. pending. Both were unsuccessful, yes. Your disciplinary proceedings <laughs> against you then commenced uh, um, later on in that year, is that correct? That's correct. And it ran for quite a considerable period of time and the outcome was then heard the following year and you were acquitted of all the charges. That's Is correct. Is that correct? Yes. What transpired after your acquittal? And I'm now at 112 of your affidavit. Uh, well, I was acquitted, so there was no reason why I couldn't go back to work. Uh, I wanted to go back to work. Um, I had become very tired um, of sitting around doing nothing. It's uh, not all that it's made up to me. And... Uh, and I wanted to go back to the SECU. The, I had been busy with uh, reasonably big matters at the time, and I wanted to get on with them. Uh, one of them was the Mbluli matter, one of them was the Kumba matter, um, and, uh, and uh, there was no reason if I'd been acquitted why I couldn't um, have an interest in Kumba again. And, uh, and certainly I was busy with the Tannenbaum Ponzi scheme, which was a, a very big matter that I'd worked very, very hard on, and I wanted to see that matter to conclusion. So. I wanted to go back to my office. Uh, I also wasn't on leave. 
uh, I wasn't suspended, uh, I was just in limbo and it was untenable, so I wanted to go back to my office. In fact, on, if I go to 114, your attorney wrote to them advising them that you were no longer suspended, you wanted to return to work, and he drew the attention to a paragraph in Advocate Jeeba's affidavit in the Labour Court where she said if the applicant is found not guilty, it will be the end of the matter and the applicant would be entitled to resume her duties in the capacity in which she had been employed. Yes, that's that correct. correct? Yeah. Right. A meeting then ensued mm -hmm. um, subsequent to this letter. Um, being uh, uh, sent. Um, and can you tell us what transpired at that meeting? Well, at the meeting, um, I went with, uh, with my attorney. Um, Karen von Rensburg was there. It was facilitated by um, Advocate Makari, who had uh, prosecuted my disciplinary. Um, and there were a couple of other people there. Uh, and he said the MPA was considering its position. Um, I was told that there were two options, and I'm refreshing my memory from my affidavit now. Uh, I was told that there were two options, um, either go on special leave uh, while they considered their position, or, uh, or agree to be redeployed. Uh, Van Rensburg uh, suggested that the relationship between um, Mr. Mkwebe and myself had broken down, uh, and this extended to Advocate Jiba, and... Uh, and as a result of all the media coverage and um, uh, that other people had now laid complaints against me, which is, of course, uh, perfectly normal. As soon as somebody lays a complaint against you, every little worm crawls out of the woodwork to complain. It happens all the time and uh, not unexpected. And she said that these were being investigated. Um, uh, I made it clear that I had no difficulty reporting to either Jiba or Mkhevi. Um, it was a job. We don't have to like each other. We certainly don't have to socialize with each other. We have a job to do. I'm perfectly capable of doing my job, and I'm sure they are too. And, uh, and so we had to, in, that, in those circumstances, I was happy to go back to work. Uh, I declined to be re redeployed, and I said I wanted to go back to my office. Uh, Van Rensburg made a, a strange suggestion that I should go on some sort of special leave, but she couldn't tell me what kind of leave it would be. It's not sick leave and it's not annual leave and I don't, I don't know what leave it is. Uh, I'm not sure that this is provision made for leave like that and I was a little worried about um, uh, being paid a quite a large salary for sitting at home doing nothing under circumstances. Right. Uh, in any event, they then corresponded with my attorney after that. You then had a meeting with Advocate Chiba? Yes. Uh, I said I should now come back to the NPA and I had to meet with her to, I can't remember how they put it, re, facilitate my reintegration into the NPA, um, which I mean, is a little bizarre on its own, but we had this meeting. It was not an uncordial meeting. Um, and she said that she wanted me to go to the DPP's office while this investigation ran. I again made it clear that I was happy for the investigation to run. Uh, I certainly don't consider myself to be above any investigation. And um, I understood that they had this investigation to do and that there could be complications, but I, uh, and, and that it was reasonable to want to carry out the investigation. I told her that I would consult with my attorney, my legal team, uh, and, uh, and, re and revert with an answer. Having discussed it with my team, uh, I declined the offer and said I want to go back to my office. In fact, as you point out in 122, she pointed out that these complaints, you indicated that they were not new complaints, they had been there before. Yes, they didn't bother anybody until I was acquitted, yeah. Right. Well, they weren't added to your disciplinary inquiry at no. all? No. You ended up then going to the DPP's office in Pretoria? I did. Right. And what was the circumstances of your employment then? Well, I can't really refer to it as employment. I was again paid uh, a lot of money to sit in an empty, a very big empty office uh, with a very big empty desk uh, with absolutely nothing to do. Uh, I used to, I was very up to date on all the law reports because I had nothing to do except read law reports. Um, if I, when I could, I, I scrounged work from other colleagues uh, but, but in effect, I did absolutely nothing to earn my salary, which was 
And so this was pending an investigation that was ongoing? Yeah. And how many months did that take? Oh. Well, I, I don't know how long the investigation took. I left before it was finalised. If it was finalised, I, I have no idea what happened to it. Um, I, I became very disgruntled just sitting around. Um, I went to Ms. Nyati and said, you've got to give me work to do. He gave me one case to work on, um, which I did. Uh, but one case certainly isn't enough to keep you busy uh, for a work week. And, uh, and then other events overtook uh, the... My, my position at the NPA, I was offered, uh, uh, I was approached by Helen Zilla to, to uh, go to Parliament. I decided that that's what I would do. Uh, then, um, uh, then uh, Ms. Jiba was uh, removed as the NDPP. Mr. Nkosana was appointed. I had a meeting with him. Um, he had said he would reconsider my position at the DPP's office. Um, he would call for the disciplinary documents and read them. Uh, and also for the other matter and, and have a look at that. Uh, I found him to be very... Uh, I went to the meeting uh, determined to dislike him intensely uh, and with the idea that he was probably just another puppet. I must say that uh, at the meeting he, he was uh, extremely sincere, he was extremely decent and I, I really did form a very good impression of him. I think he wanted to be the real deal. I don't think he was given that opportunity. And, um, and then I, I had already decided uh, some a few days after that that I would, I would leave. Uh, I then went to, to tell him that I was going to, to resign. Um, I intended to leave at the end of uh, February. Um, uh, up to then, I had no interest in, in politics and um, I had no idea how uh, the election system worked in, in terms of lists, etc. At some point, it became clear to me that um, I would have to join a political party before the election started. You have to be a member of the DA to, to be on their list. You can't be a prosecutor and on the list or a member of a political party. So I went to him and I told him that, that now my position had changed, that I, I could no longer uh, stay because I had, um, he asked for three months to, to try and persuade me otherwise. So I agreed to the three months in order to give him time to think and he indicated that, um, that until the end of April, while he was giving the matter thought and working through it, um, because of the, my position as a member of a political party, I should not come into the office, which I then did. I didn't go into the office. Yeah. You expressed an opinion about Mr. Nksana in paragraph 29 and 30 of your affidavit, 129, uh. 130. Uh -huh. Can you tell us what informed that thinking? Well, he appeared uh, really very sincere about trying his very best to do a difficult job. Um, the National Director of Public Prosecution is a very big job. And it's not easy to do, and uh, I understand that fully. Um, he impressed me as being um, uh, somebody who was sincere. That, that He treated me extremely uh, politely. Um, he, uh, he gave me the impression of someone who was really, really decent and trying hard. He understood what he was grappling with at the NPA. He understood what was necessary to prosecute without fear, favor, or prejudice. Uh, he was new to the NPA. I felt uh, desperately sorry for him because um, he, you know, he could not be familiar with the, the surroundings. He had never had any history in the NPA. Um, but, but from our discussion, which was over quite a period of time, he made it. Um, he, he left me with the impression that he had every intention of trying very hard to give direction to the NPA and to uh, attend to those matters that were, were going wrong and to, uh, to restore the NPA to the, to the organization that it should be. You make the comment that he was calling for dockets that had long been buried. He was asking all the questions that made others uneasy. And you knew he would not last. What did you mean by that? Oh, well, that, that was after the meeting, of course. He then asked for certainly the, uh, the Zuma docket, the Spartaps docket. He asked for... Uh, the, the Lily docket, and as soon as that happened, um, I knew that the pushback would be enormous, uh, and and that he he stood in the position that he was with 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 no background in the NPA, so probably no uh, people who could properly advise him about the way around. 
um, that he stood no chance. And that even though he was going to give it his very best shot, I thought that that uh, he would he would not survive it, and, and he didn't. At the time when Mr. Naksana was there, you say in 131, he called for the docket relating to criminal charges against you, but was told that it didn't exist. That's, How that's do you know what he, that? He told me that. He told you that? Yeah. And when you were charged, was that after he left? Oh, yes. What happened at your criminal trial? I was acquitted. My attorney was prosecuted with me for giving me legal advice. He was also acquitted. So, effectively, despite all steps that were taken, taken against you, and despite the yeah. advices which Advocate Mkwebi rendered to Advocate Jiba on 12th of January, none of them came to fruition. None. I have no further question. Thank you, Advocate uh, Bauer. Any questions for me? Any questions? Yeah. Why do you want to ask me that? After cross examination. Okay. Uh, was there being no questions from the panelists? I was wondering if uh, you would proceed with cross-examination immediately. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. And usually you have an arrangement between the Mkwebi and the uh, uh, Jiba Council. Who goes first this time? Can you kindly speak into the... Yes. Thank you, Thank Chairperson. You. Yeah, we, we, I will go first. Uh, the only issue that we were just uh, briefly discussing was whether we should start now or whether we should ask for an early lunch adjournment. What is okay, Mr. We can continue? Or we should break. We, we, <laughs> okay, we, there. <laughs> he comes to your rescue. To, you don't have to ask that question because be the happy. recording man says we he needs a break. Yeah. So, are you willing that we break for early lunch? You wanted to say something. No, I just wanted to confirm that it would also be in order with us to take an early lunch. We can just no. type some loose ends and then um, yeah. deal with whatever we have to deal with after lunch. Yeah. It is ordinarily a convenient thing to do. Yes. You know, before, between. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nasreen? Um, I, I'm, I'm fine with that, but could we then come back at 1.30, which would give us an hour, because Advocate Breidenbach has a flight this evening and uh, if we could then try and accommodate that. I'm not Don't trying worry. to put any pressure on my colleagues, but yes. if instead of having an hour and a half lunch, to just have an hour lunch and see if we can... Don't do worry, that. I was going to ask for your views, okay? Yes. You Thank normally you, have, have the last say. The witness has the last say. In Sichuana, we would say, the one who has the last say is the real deal. Okay, yeah. <laughs> But uh, I don't know if the lunch is ready. We have to break. It's just a question of coming back early. We can have a quick lunch, isn't it? Can we come back at 1.30? Thank you.